break this up into three sections. We're going to have a quick break in between them, more or less as specified on, on the blue PowerPoint there. Um, and with that, I'm just going to go ahead and launch into it. Um, a couple of things that I did want to mention. Um, one, I am a Forest Service person, so my entire career has been based on public land management. And so this outlook on hazard trees is very much colored by my experience being a natural resources person. I do believe the methods and backbone of what we're going to be talking about is applicable to other circumstances, but people who are not in public land management um, like a, a public agency might have to do a little bit of translation of some of my biases. <laughs> it's hard to get away from your own biases of, of a long career. So that's one thing. The other thing, um, just my teaching method, when I'm doing a PowerPoint, um, I assume everybody can read <laughs> and I try to avoid reading from slides if I can possibly avoid it. Sometimes it's necessary just for organizational purposes or to keep the flow of the presentation going. But if there is any question, please put them into the chat box and we will address them as, as soon as practically possible. Okay, so I am, um, work, I do work, excuse me, with a Forest Service in a group called Forest Health Protection. And this is just a little bit of information on what we do. Uh, we are a technical assistance provider. Uh, we are mostly providing technical assistance on forest insects and diseases. And into that mixture, hazard trees, obviously, is, is one of the things that we do. Um, we also are assessing impacts of forest insects and diseases. We do surveys, both aerially, ground, and we're actually exploring some other methods for that as well. Um, our primary job, however, is that we are consultants. We're people that are called out primarily on public land management issues related to forest health. We do do a little bit of special projects and we also um, do training like teaching hazard tree classes. Okay, so here's our introduction and objectives. Um, I mentioned that this is gonna be colored from a public land manager standpoint. And my first bullet point actually hits right on that. So we're trying to understand what responsibilities are for hazard tree management. We also are trying to address fundamentally what is a safety issue and that's hazard trees. <laughs> and we're focused on developed recreation sites. <laughs> um, we're gonna try and learn to recognize and assess things regarding hazard trees. And it's gonna be using a tool that um, Macon hyperlinked there at the start and was also in the announcements. And it's a new guide that was put out by the Forest Service from two of our regions, regions one and four. And it has a whole bunch of resources that I'm going to point out to you as we're going through the presentation here. Okay, so just a couple of awareness slides about the destructive power of hazard trees. This camper um, was struck in a developed recreation site and there were injuries in, involved with this hazard tree failure. Here's another one that actually happened just a couple of days before the site opened. But again, I'm just trying to build a little bit of awareness of what might have happened if this site had been occupied by some people at, at the time that that tree failed. Okay, so why are we gonna be talking about managing hazard trees? Um, almost all of us, I think, have got some management responsibility that involves maintaining resources. We wanna keep our facilities open. We want to do that in such a way that it's safe and that we're basically just keeping a safe, publicly available resource available. And my final point on this one is we're going to try and detect the detectable. And there's always been a background thing in hazard tree management that you cannot defect, detect, excuse me, all trees that might have something that's going to lead them to fall down. So we're trying to detect the things that give us some obvious, obvious indicators. And I'm gonna be going through those indicators in a, in a lot of detail. Okay, a couple of legal things. And I point off, I point out, excuse me, always at the start of these that I'm not a lawyer. 
I'm a plant pathologist. <laughs> and so if you're getting your legal advice from a plant pathologist, you're probably not getting it from the right place. But there's a couple of terms that I think are important just so we're understanding some viewpoints and where we're coming from here. And I love this first one that definition of standard of care because it's one of those classic little legal things that kind of runs around in circles. And I'd like to draw your attention to two words in that definition. One is prudence and the other one is reasonable as in a reasonable person. So in this definition, prudence is just wisdom. Another definition synonym for prudence is caution. If you look it up in the dictionary, you can also see attentiveness in some definitions. So it's kind of working around in a little circle. But someone who is exercising prudent is being wise and cautious. And that basically is the same definition of what a reasonable person is in these circumstances. Second definition I wanted to get into is what is duty. And that can have a number of different meanings depending on your circumstances. Relating that to hazard trees, <laughs> It is, for my definition here, the duty is the mandatory action that you're going to take and it's derived from laws, regulation, policies, or what's in the contract that makes it your responsibility to deal with hazard trees. And generally it's a, um, a tree owner's duty to prevent harm by getting rid of obvious hazards and thereby acting in a prudent fashion. Okay, so I am a Forest Service person. This is a definition that's right out of the Forest Service manual. And this is a policy for Forest Service people. And you can see that that is directly mentioned um, in the Forest Service manual and handbook uh, that this is one of the responsibilities that public land managers have. Pointing out using the definition of duty that we just defined a minute ago, the duty is highest for hazard tree management and appraisal when you're charging a fee for using the site. And that you, I think, can find reflected in other legal definitions, whether you're in a municipal setting or any other setting. If you're charging a fee, your duty is magnified. Okay, for Forest Service people, um, I do advise you, if you have any legal questions, to consult the Office of the General Counsel. They're the Forest Service's lawyers. And for people who are doing hazard tree work as a responsibility that's detailed in a contract, I would strongly advise you to be really cognizant of what's in your contract. Um, that is, in effect, the policy and legal definition of what your responsibilities are. Okay, so what's a hazard tree? I'm going to get into our fundamental definition here and then break it down into different parts. A hazard tree, for our purposes today, is a tree that has indicators that it could fail and it could cause damage to something that we value. Okay, so let's get into that in a little bit more detail. It's going to be broken down, our rating system, into three parts. First part is failure potential, and that's just some characteristic of the tree that may cause it to fall or fail. It's broken down into damage potential, and that is pretty self-explanatory. It's the potential to do damage. And it also has a target value. And target value has a couple of components, and I'll spell those out for you here in just a minute. It's primarily going to be based on where people and valued property are located. Okay, failure potential. That is a potential that a tree part's going to fall, and it's broken down into one to four point scale. What we're going to be looking for first and foremost, is going to be defects, things that clue you in that the tree might be defective. We are going to be, in some cases, looking for patterns among trees. The thing that pops first to my mind when I start talking about that is if you're in a situation where you had some root disease present in your trees. Root diseases have a very definite pattern wherever they occur. They tend to occur in pockets, so that might be something that you're going to be looking for. We're also going to be talking about the way defects interact primarily within a tree, but I'll also talk a little bit about the way that defects interact within a group of trees. <laughs> okay, so failure potential scores. They range from one to four, and we're going to start high. 
So high is going to simply be dead trees, trees with major defects. We're also going to be talking about decay and how that works. And we'll be talking a little bit about damaged trees that are damaged by burning. And we will do an extensive definition of what we mean by sound wood in a tree. Medium level defects, more mid, basically the same idea. We're going to get a little bit more into the, the weeds here on what the decay means at the moderate level. And then low and very low, under most circumstances, that is not going to be a condition where these trees are going to get a high hazard tree rating. Um, but this may be, in some cases, you want to record that it's not having a high rating. Okay, so damage potential ranges from one to three. And the main reason that we included damage potential in this particular hazard rating system is because not all failures are whole trees. And when you look at a lot of hazard tree rating systems, they only have two components, something addressing defect and something addressing target. Our system includes this damage potential because we have had incidences, including um, fatalities, where we've had those caused by parts of trees, particularly large parts of trees falling from a fairly good height, um, can be potentially a very dangerous situation. And we wanted to build into an element that addressed that. Okay, so damage potential takes into account the tree part size and what height that it's going to be falling from. And if you have a small tree part, it's going to cause more damage, obviously, if it's falling from a greater height. So damage potential, again, ranging from one to three. And three is going to be used exclusively if you're thinking about the whole tree. So if you're evaluating and looking at a whole tree, damage potential is always going to be at a three. We do think about the directness of impact and whether or not it's going to fall directly towards the places where you might have um, a high impact zone. And we're talking about severe damages here if this part were to fail. Moderate, basically thinking about the same ideas, but moderate potential for damage. And minor, we have to put a definition limit at some point, and we're going to put our uh, size of tree part at three inches in diameter, being the smallest part that we consider that might do some damage. Um, these might be something that fall, have a little bit direct or a little bit indirect type impact. And you can see how that works when we get into the process. Okay, so let's talk about target value here. This is a value that is given to a tree and it's based on its proximity to where people and property are present, not only present, but they're present there for a long period of time. So target value has two elements, proximity and time. So it's going to be focused more on where people are there for longer periods of time. Moderate, again, the same idea, but just slightly lower. So moderate use, shorter persistence, places where you might have people there for a, long, a shorter period of time. Okay, and low, limited use, short persistence. Okay, just to give you an idea what that might look like, a natural resources type setting, drawing your attention to that tree and the upper le um, left side of the picture on the upper right side of the screen. Um, the only thing that potentially could fall on is maybe the fence for the sign, so the target value is going to be low. The second one there, that is going to be a situation where it might fall toward a tree that's defective around that area, might fall towards a water station there, so that's going to be moderate. And a high target value is going to be in areas around something where you have continued ongoing use by lots of people. Okay, just talking about the guide a little bit, and hopefully everybody was able to download this. I'm just going to break down what's in there. Of course, it has a table of contents. And chapters one and two are going to be running through the material basically that I'm talking about right now, introducing the topic and then getting into the components of the hazard tree rating system. And we're going to talk about potential impact zones here in just a minute. Chapter three gets into planning and documentation, how, when, and where you might be wanting to survey, and then also gets into a little bit of the details and defining what a sound wood shell is. 
And table two on page 14 of the guide is a very important resource if, when you're getting out into the process of doing this. Okay, chapter four gets into specific information on different kinds of defects and diseases um, based on the knowledge and experience of the five uh, forest pathologists that put this guide together. And we talk about specific failure potentials associated with specific diseases and other types of defects. So that's a, a great resource for you when you're actually getting into what might be going on out on the ground. Okay, there is a glossary and then there is an appendix. Just wanted to point out that the survey form is on page 71 and 72 and some of the other definitions are in the pages that are near that. Okay, so getting into hazard tree survey procedures. We're gonna talk about types of surveys. We're gonna talk about where to survey, how, and recording ratings and diseases, recording corrective actions, and then the process of documentation. Okay, so one way that you can approach a hazard tree survey, and this is very commonly done in a natural resource setting, is prior to opening the site in the spring, there's a pre-season systemic walkthrough of the area. And on the Forest Service form that's available for this process, it actually has an element of looking at hazard trees. It's basically just kind of a quick and dirty walkthrough, um, seeing if anything has changed, if anything new developed over the winter that might be leading you to believe that there's additional hazard tree problems. <laughs> Most of what I'm gonna be focusing on today is conducting a baseline, much more detailed survey. We do recommend doing these about every five years. Okay, one other type survey that may be necessary is an ad hoc survey and we do this in special circumstances, like for example, if you had a big windstorm that caused a lot of trees to go under a lot of structural load, you might be thinking about doing a, a special at need survey at that point. Okay, so where to survey, and we're gonna kind of be, gonna be emphasizing this idea in a couple of different ways, but we're basically gonna be focusing in on where the people are. <laughs> um, I made an old joke in hazard tree talks for, for many years. <laughs> that you might have a tree fall on a fairly valuable structure, um, but that structure is not going to suit you. Hmm. So always the focus of hazard tree evaluation should be on where the people be, are. Hmm. Near structures, again, with the focus on that's where the people are gonna be. We think about roads and heavy use paths as part of this process as well. And here's an idea of just kind of what that might look like in a particular site. If you go through and look at the different things that might be available, this is basically a map of a campground area with some numbered units. The ages are water hydrants and the, the T's are actually where the sanitary facilities are. And in this particular case, I'd like to think that the highest use areas are gonna be focused around where the people are located on the camping pads. So that would be defining your highest use areas. <laughs> okay, moderate use area might be along the roadways and down at the bottom of the screen on the right, you can see there's a heavily used path. That'd be something that we could consider to be a moderate use area. And then lightly used areas, let's say just for our imagination purposes, that that path in the upper part of the screen there on the left is very lightly used or that they have a road that's closed and only very occasionally used in the middle of the screen. That might be a low use area. A lot of this definition of where potential impact zones and use areas, um, and you can see that on page eight of our guide, and there's some additional examples related to slope and different orientations with dead tops and how trees um, might be creating different types of potential impact zones on pages seven to nine of the guide. But most of this information is gonna be focused on one tree height. And that's gonna be the primary area we're gonna be putting all of our focus on and what trees we're going to be evaluating. Okay, just wanted to point out a little bit of math that people probably got fairly early in their 
education process. And that's the unique features of a 45 degree right triangle. And the main feature that I'm pointing out here is that the length of A equals B. And I'm going to be applying that in a minute here. And you can use that to define when a tree might fall into an area where you have a heavy use zone. Okay, so let's say that your heavy use zone is the picnic table on the left there. And you want to define where, whether or not that tree might fall into your heavily used area. So where the potential impact zone for the tree might interact with your use zone. Okay, so if you just look at this as basically laying down a right triangle onto that situation. And the height of the tree is going to be the same as the distance from the area. If you then take a couple of steps away from your use area and look up at a 45 degree angle, you're gonna be basically looking up and if you see the top of the tree still within that 45 degree angle or exceeding, excuse me, exceeding that 45 degree angle, then that's gonna be a tree that potentially could fall into your use area. And so my yellow glowing man here is about two steps away from the use area. And if he looks up and sees the top of the tree, falls within that 45 degree angle, that's not a tree that can fall into his use area. Okay, so what about one that could fall in? This tree is obviously closer and yellow glowing man there. Um, if he looks up at that tree, he's gonna look up at a 45 degree angle and see that that tree easily falls within that 45 degree angle. And that's a tree that could fall into your use area. And this is my extremely high tech way of looking at measuring a 45 degree angle that I made in like five minutes with some cardboard and miscellaneous that I found in a drawer. <laughs> um, the idea behind this being that it doesn't need to be a hugely complicated tool in order to determine whether or not the trees might fall into the use area. You can make a very simple device to do that. There are other ways of doing this. Um, clinometers, there are survey lasers that are capable of determining tree heights and distances. Um, there are a number of different tools from the simple to the complex that can be used in order to determine whether a tree might reach into your area. Um, a couple of other points on tools here. Um, mostly because we will be talking about some of these here in a minute. Um, one of my next few slides is going to be talking about making a map and for that purpose a compass and a logger's tape and a logger's tape to non-forestry people is just a long measuring tape that um, recoils automatically and you can use that easily for measuring distances on the ground and you can also take tree diameters with it. <laughs> Okay, so I'll get into tools a little bit more later on when we start talking about decay detection and some of the things that go into that. Okay, so how to survey. One of the first things we'd like to ask people to do is evaluate the site from a distance, basically as you're walking into it. And the things that you can learn from this might be the vigor and condition of the trees. You might be spotting some widowmaker that was not immediately available for vision if you're standing right on the site. But walking into the site is when you turn on your hazard tree sense and start looking at the trees. And you're looking for any dangerous situations. Once inside the survey area, that's when you start getting into the actual doing of the hazard tree survey. And one thing that we like to get you to do is to establish reference points. And you do that by establishing um, a permanent fixture for relocation. Sorry, a little distracted there. My cell phone just rang. <laughs> anyway, and one way that you can go about doing this is a pretty simple and direct method. You just pick a permanent object. In this case, they used the fire pit in a developed recreation site, but it could be any permanent object, a cemented down picnic table, um, anything that's not going to move. And then you measure the distance and bearing. So you take out that measuring tape, measure the distance to the tree, and then take the compass and measure the bearing to the tree. Um, this is really useful, particularly when you're following up on your evaluations and going in and doing the actual treatment to the tree. You need a way to connect the people who are doing the hazard tree mitigation 
to the particular tree that you're evaluating. And this is one way to do it. Okay, so getting into the actual individual tree exams. What are we going to be doing? We're going to be looking for some obvious defects. Obviously, if the tree is dead or dying, it's going to get um, some pretty serious failure potential ratings. Then you start focusing in and trying to look at the defects. And one of the main things that we're going to be looking for is rotter disease. And specifically, how that rotter disease might interact with the strength of the tree, causing it to be more likely to fall down. And we're also going to talk about whether defects interact. And I'll get into some more details on that here in a few minutes. Okay, so individual tree exams continued. You're then going to be measuring, or excuse me, determining damage potential and target value. And then you're simply going to be adding these values up. So if your potential runs from one to four, damage potential one to three, target value one to three, and then you simply add up those values for the total rating for the tree. And that process directly ties you in to priority for treatment. A maxed out hazard tree rating number of 10 would be the same as basically assigning a very high treatment priority. A severe is kind of a funny word for it because that's borrowed from the hazard tree rating. But anyway, that would be a very high level of priority for treatment for a severe rating of hazard trees. Nine's going to be a little bit lower, but still a high priority. Eight's probably moderate. And anything below, seven or below, is going to be low. Okay. Um, hazard tree mitigation in a natural resources setting is usually pretty simple. You just fire up the chainsaw and cut it at the base. Um, it may be possible in some situations to move people away from the potential impact zone for a particular tree. Um, that is a pretty specific situation and you'd only really do that if you had a highly defective tree that had some other value to the site, but you just didn't want anyone anywhere near it. <laughs> so it might be possible to direct people away, move the picnic table off one of the trees, something like that. Okay, so I've only had this happen a couple of times where I've walked into a particular site and started looking around at the tree hazards and seeing, oh my goodness, this has just got crazy amounts of, of hazard trees. Um, my recommendation is actually going to be to close the facility until you deal with the hazards. Um, that is never a popular thing in a natural resources setting. Um, does not make me any friends with the uh, local land managers. <laughs> One final point I'd like to make on this subject, um, and I've seen this done very, very badly on some public land management settings. If you are thinking about doing any sort of treatment of an arboricultural sort, um, consult a professional, <laughs> get an arborist out there to, to look at the situation. I've seen improvised cable and bracing and support systems that really didn't work at all and were a pretty bad idea. So if you are talking about doing any sort of cabling or bracing, consult a professional. Okay, so documentation. And fundamentally, while we're gonna go through this whole process, is from a legal standpoint, if you don't document it, you can't prove that you did it. One of the attorneys that I've also, um, often consulted with even phrases this a little bit stronger. And she's told me, okay, if you don't document it, you didn't do it. From a legal standpoint, we can't support you because we have no way of being able to determine what you actually did. Um, we do recommend following the instructions that we're gonna be walking through using the resources in the guide including the back of the form for the defect categories. Okay, so this is the basic form, and this is the front of the data form that we're going to be walking you through. Um, this form has two sides, and I'm going to be giving you some detailed description of what all it was in there. But this is a form of documentation that we're recommending in this guide. Also recommending in this that you do can construct maps so that it makes it easier to relocate. On the back of this data form, it has some categories um, and you can see what those are there. We will be walking you through the, those definitions. 
Um, some of them are kind of overlapping with a couple of different things that are kind of lumped together because they're similar. And some of them are fairly simple. That's the form and that's going to be the way that we're going to be using it. You use chapter four as you're starting to build competence and starting to recognize some of the things that cause different defects. So for example, we're going to be talking about pine rot here. And that shows you a page directly out of chapter four. And this will give you inside that blue box some specific information for what to do when you have that specific problem. So that's what chapter four is for. You need to be able to recognize the specific defect and or disease, and then that gives you additional information that you can use in your rating. And that's what it looks like here, that blue box magnified a little bit. And for example, if you had a failure potential for with um, pine eye decay, it spells out for you the type of things that you might be looking for in regards to conks or decay or cracks and that sort of thing. And I'll run you through some examples of using that specific information in the rating of the tree. I did want to point out a couple of things in the rating language here. Um, you'll notice that there is a large uh, uppercase or in there, and there's also lowercase ors. The uppercase or separates two different descriptions. The lowercase or just indicates that that the things that are around are part of the same description. So take for example, that first one there in failure potential four, um, you'd be talking about if you have two conks greater than six inches wide without visible cracks, or if you have decay. Second description, following the big or, any conch greater than six inches wide, or two conchs less than six inches wide, and visible decay. So the big or separates two separate descriptions that fall into the same failure potential category. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit of background information on decay. And we start that off with tree structure. What causes it? How does it get into the tree? How do you know if it's there? How do trees react to the process of decay? And is decay always detectable? A few key terms here. A conch is kind of a slangy name for a fungal fruiting body. In particular, decay organisms tend to produce conchs. I'm gonna talk a little bit, very, very briefly touch on the idea of compartmentalization. And that's basically the process by which trees defend themselves and trees fundamentally defend themselves by trying to wall something into a compartment. And I'll show you a little bit more information here on that in, in a minute. Okay, so, whoops, I left out a couple of things. We're gonna talk about what sound wood shell is, talk about sapwood and hardwood and how callus tissue formation occurs. So, tree structure, we're gonna start from the outer and work in. We have outer bark, which functions is protective. Inside of the outer bark, there are phloem tissues, and their main function is to move um, food around within the tree. Right inside the phloem tissue is a very, very thin layer, only a couple of cell layers thick, called the vascular cambium. And the vascular cambium is a generative tissue, and its function is that it produces phloem tissue to the outside into the bark area and it produces woody tissues towards the inside. Also wanted to point out heartwood versus sapwood in this slide. And sapwood, from the functional definition that I'm giving you today, is the wood that is mostly responsible for conducting water from the root system down up to the, or excuse me, from the root system up to the leaves in the tree. Heartwood is wood that is no longer functioning in water conduction like sapwood is. And it's commonly used by trees as kind of a, a storing place. They dump some leftover metabolites and chemicals into the heartwood. One important feature about heartwood is because of these chemicals that the tree dumps into it, it is actually more resistant to decay than the sapwood is. Okay. Decay in living trees. It is all going to be caused by fungi, things analogous to mushrooms. 
these types of organisms tend to increase in a group of trees as they age. A stand is a forester's term for a group of trees. Anyway, so as trees age, the likelihood that they might have been wounded increases and wounds are one of the fundamental starting places for decay. You have to have a wound in order for decay to get started. Conks can be present or absent. Um, in the dry intermountain climate that I live in, fungal fruiting bodies or conks are actually pretty rare. You gotta have a lot of decay present before they can be, you're seeing a lot of conks. If you move north into moister climates, fruiting bodies or conks become a lot more common. Already mentioned wounds briefly, they are necessary for decay fungi to get into a tree in almost all cases. And they're frequently also a good place to look for decay. They kind of give you a window into the tree. Okay, so the amount of decay varies by a whole bunch of factors here that I'm laying out for you. Um, wound size, different tree species are more decay prone. Different decays have different level of aggressiveness and ability to degrade wood. So there are a whole bunch of different features that go into whether or not the decay is going to be extensive within the tree. Okay, so this is the wound on the outside of a tree. And I'm trying to walk you through the process of how trees seal over damage to the outside. And there's kind of an old saw in um, tree anatomy, the trees don't heal like a animal might heal. If I were to cut my skin, that will just heal right back over, might leave a scar. But trees don't do that. They basically just seal stuff up inside of compartments. And this is just a space through a place where there's callus tissue on the tree. And that dark staining stuff in the, in the center of the photograph there is basically a slice right through that callus tissue. And the line there is the wood that was exposed at the time by damage. And this is many years after the damage has occurred. And at that point, there's a little bit of a decay resistant ring that's formed right underneath where the damage was. In this particular tree, decay didn't get established in there, which made it a nice clear example slide. And if you look at this area right there, I pointed out already that, that where the callus tissue is, also, if you look out into this area over here, that's where new wood has been laid down on top of where this old wound was located. The wound sealed over and the new wood was laid on, down on top of it. And that's the way that um, trees defend themselves. And that again is just pointing out that new wood that's been laid down sealed over the top. And if you look at this particular slide from left to right here, it gives you a pretty good idea of how that process might work. So on the far left there, that's basically occurring right when the wound happened. Wound occurs, fungi can infect into that wounded tissue and decay then starts. So moving over towards the right. Callus tissue in that second picture from the left there is starting to develop. And the tree is trying to seal that damage to the inside. Moving in a time sequence towards the right, the third picture there, at this point, decay process is ongoing inside the tree, but the tree is just laying down new wood on top of that decay. And then as you move over to the two pictures on the right, it's just adding down more and more wood. And we're going to use that width of that sound wood that has developed over this decay as one of the fundamental things that we're going to be using to make a strength determination in trees. Okay, so um, I promised you guys a break after 45 minutes and we're right on time for that. 